I'm Rehart and you're watching episode 13 of The Nag Show. In this week's show, we check out Martian Monitors, a South African brand that is hoping to bring a new range of gaming monitors to the market. And we've got some prototypes to show you. We also have a look at how well the new Intel Arc A750 perform on Lens' new high-end 13th gen gaming computer. This thing is a beast and probably a bit overkill for the Arc A750, so check it out later in the show. Then, if you're a content creator, you want to stay tuned for our interview with Bum Flavsky, who is doing a number of cool things to build the local scene and help local content creators improve their craft. And finally, we look at the Ergo G Gaming Chair, the perfect accessory for your gaming setup if you spend hours upon hours on your desk every day. And it's customizable. But first, how good is your video game knowledge? Think you know your stuff? See if you can answer these questions in this week's Quest for, for knowledge. knowledge. Question 1. What was the first product that Nintendo launched? Question 2. What was the first open world RPG game ever created? And question 3. What is the name of the first video game to feature a boss fight? Don't go asking ChatGPT for the answers now, we'll give them to you at the end of the show. Stay watching until after the credits. But first, it's time to get a little geeky with the prototype Martian monitors that we've been playing with. You can check out Cody's full review on nag.co.za for more technical details, but here's the lowdown. Martian is a new brand of gaming monitor expected to launch in 2024. Believe it or not, this is a South African brand and if you were at Rage 2022, you may even have experienced some of these monitors for yourself. The company aims to deliver a competitively priced product when it launches and by all accounts it seems as if they're going after the mid-range and enthusiast market. They were kind enough to let us play with the second generation engineering samples for the last few weeks and we've been pretty well impressed with these products all around. It should be noted here that the company will be releasing their fourth generation products when they launch next year. We've not been able to get a hold of those but Martian says they're already testing their fourth gen product. These two are the A and B series monitors. The B series has RGB and a glossy black logo, while the A series has no RGB and just a silver logo. Other differences between the two include the refresh rate. The B series sports a 144Hz refresh rate with a 1ms response time, while the A series has a 180Hz refresh rate with a 3ms response time. We're not quite sure what the rating the launch models will have, but for now these offered plenty of range for our gaming efforts. We're also expecting that these monitors will have different aesthetics when it comes time for launch, so we're focusing on the panels for now. The long and the short of it is that we're impressed. Playing games across a variety of gaming machines over the past few weeks have been a pleasant experience, with bright visuals and overall great performance, thanks to the G-Sync and FreeSync compatibility. Are we excited that they'll be launching to market next year? Yes, but for now, we'll have to wait in anticipation. We've been having loads of fun with the Intel Arc A750 graphics card and this week we installed it in Lens high-end gaming rig, consisting of the Beast, the Intel Core i9-3900KF processor, running on the MSI Mag Z790 Tomahawk Wi-Fi motherboard. Then there's 64GB of DDR5 RAM and a massive 4TB Corsair MP600 Pro XT NVMe drive. As was expected, there were no bottlenecks here, and after we wiped the drool from our faces, we removed the NVIDIA GeForce 3080 that was in there and replaced it with the Arc A750. Of course, this is a small step down when you compare the specs, so we don't expect this to be sort of downgrade you see happen with this graphics card, but we wanted to show you how well the Arc performs on a high-end machine. Apart from looking really good in this rig, and no Len, you're not keeping the Arc A750, we were quite impressed overall. Cyberpunk 2077 ran really well on medium and low ray tracing settings, delivering just under 50 frames per second for low and just over 70 frames per second for medium. On ultra settings we got just over 80 frames per second. 3D Mark Speedway delivered a score of 2381 compared to 2357 on the 11th gen rig we first benchmarked this card on. You can check out episode 10 for more details. Port Royale delivered a score of 6,645 compared to 6,607 on the 11th gen rig. Overall, really close comparisons all round, showing that these are the sweet spot numbers for this graphics card. Of course, we don't expect this card to be used in such high-end hardware. The Arc A750 is ideally suited for entry to mid-range upgrades. You can check out the technical conversation I had with Naya from the Overclocker in episode 12 of the NAG show. If there's anything you'd like to know about the Arc A750, drop us a comment below. So, Mr. Bumflavsky, you've been hovering around the content creator scene for, for quite a while now. I've been following you on Twitter for the last uh, few years, I think it's been now. And I really like what you're getting up to with the content creators. Please introduce yourself. 
Uh, my name is Bum Flosky. I think people call me that more than they call me Chris these days. Um, I've been streaming since the end of 2016, so I'm a bit of a bully when it comes to the scene. Um, and yeah, I've, I've kind of dipped into the space between creators and brands now, trying to make content creators more professional, trying to let brands understand the true power of streaming or interactive marketing is, is what I, I like to call it when I talk to brands. Um, and I've found myself a, a little home here in the middle where it's, it's really starting to grow. It, it's really cool. It's a nice place to be working. And you've been doing some nice things with content creators, helping them to kind of, you know, understand their craft better and the industry better and, you know, also potentially get better at what they do. Yes, yeah, so I dipped into a, a space, maybe a profession I created called content creator coaching. And in that space, it's, it's all about teaching content creators how to build a brand, how to market their brand, how to collaborate with corporates mm -hmm. and how to grow both spaces at the same time. So it's been really cool. My background is as a chartered accountant, I dealt a lot with tech startups um, and a lot of product launches. So it was really cool to take the knowledge that I've studied at end and create a bit of conversation when I get to, br to Bryce because you yeah, know, talking about being a CA isn't the most interesting conversation, as I'm sure you can imagine. I'm sure there must be something creative about uh, being a CA. I was trying to make a witty quip about what CA stands for, but we won't go down that road. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I think we both, we had a few chats uh, running up to this interview, and I think one of the things we kind of agree on is that there's a lot of work still needed in the content creator space in South Africa. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I try and consume as much as possible, but there's very few places where I actually see a few gems popping up and people that I really find myself wanting to go back to and see what they have to say or do on, on video. Um, what do you think is the kind of the big thing? What is the big missing thing that we have here compared to maybe more international uh, content creators? Um, I think we're very heavy on the passion side. I think we've got a lot of content creators that are creating content because they love what they do. And um, it, it's definitely lacking on the professional side. So uh, I think when people start approaching it from a professional standpoint, they think they have to sacrifice passion, but all they have to do is get the professionalism to catch up the, pa the passion side of things. Um, so I think people need to understand their brand a lot more, understand what value they're providing to brands. I, I don't think they understand that at all. And it's, it's a very unique space. It's a very new age here in South Africa. Um, but we can measure the distance between here and established markets like the US and the UK and most of Europe, really. And we can see what we still need to do. And it, I think it's very heavily on the professional side, just understanding that each of us as a brand, as a content creator, are a business um, and what we can do with that. And also, I think the underlying thing for me when it comes to the actual content is kind of you need to find your own voice. And... Uh I, I hate to say the word be interesting, but the thing is you need to kind of do something that makes people want to come back to you. It's not just about sitting and doing something. I think a lot of gamers fall under that maybe misconception of what that kind of thing should be. I mean, if you're happy with just streaming your gameplay, that's great. But I think, you know, what do people come back for? You know, if you, you don't have to be a pro player, but, you know, your wit or your commentary or your jokes, or there could be something that makes me want to be there. Or come back to see what those antics are or maybe even it's just you know good old wholesome conversation with fans yeah it, it dips back into the original conversation of becoming a brand yourself because when content creation in its definition is um, people that create content that's consumed within a niche and I think everybody looks at each other's content and goes oh, I want to do the same as that person I want to speak to the same crowd as that person and what they're doing is they are they're, they're duplicating a niche. And when you duplicate a niche, there's no need for somebody to go and see somebody that's replicating somebody else's content. They'll just go to the original creator of their content. So there's a lot of eyes on other people's content, on other people's journeys, and not on establishing one's own brand and niche. And when you do that, you really negate your, um, your ability to offer content as a true content creator, true to yourself, true to your audience. Um, because that, that's the real special part is... Um, if we if we let ourselves be unapologetically ourselves, then we create a niche organically, and that's what people are are falling behind on. I think. So you certainly have some words of wisdom to share with us. I think we can have regular chats about this. We've already been speaking about some other content things that we're going to be doing together. But uh, where can people reach if they want to kind of yeah reach out to you for your services uh, and get some help? 
I'm really excited about the future projects that we're doing together. The stuff we've been talking about is amazing. I'm, I'm really excited, and it's great to have a back in with a magazine that I used to steal money from my parents to to go and sneak into CNA and go and buy. Um, you can find me absolutely anywhere. You can just type in Bumflowski. I don't think anybody's challenging me for that username. Um, <laughs> but on any of my socials, you can find my link tree, and my link tree has just got absolutely everything within there. Fantastic. Uh, we'll chat again very soon, Bamfavsky, and uh, yeah, good luck with the content creators. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. Thank you. When it comes to gaming chairs, there are as many options as there are design styles on the market. I've been driving a Cougar racing chair for the past few years, and it's been one of the best gaming chairs I've ever used. I even take power naps on the thing. It's great. So I reluctantly reviewed a new gaming chair recently when the opportunity came around. You can say I did it in the name of Ergonomics. The Ergo G gaming chair from Ergo Therapy is a customizable product that is built with the right support in the right places to offer super comfortable gaming experience, especially for long sessions. The chair features the usual adjustment settings you would expect, including a headrest adjustment, but I did feel the headrest did not reach high enough for me to enjoy it. When it comes to the nap factor, this chair offers a comfortable snooze, with the chair able to lean back just far enough for you to be able to put your feet up. Probably the most important aspect to this chair is the lumbar support by way of a mesh backing. This was one of the most notable features of this gaming chair and one that offers the right back support for my long days in front of the PC. The model we were sent for review features this cool God of War logo, but Ergo Therapy told us that this won't be available for resale. Gamers can however have their own logo or brand stitched onto the headrest for about 500 bucks. The chair itself costs just under 10,000 Rand and you have 7 colors to choose from. It's a pricey investment if you consider that most gaming chairs cost about half of that, but this one seems to hit the right mark in all the right body supported places. If I had the budget, I would consider one of these. And that's it for episode 13 of The Nag Show. As always, if you'd like to be a part of the show and give us a review on a game or gaming hardware you think you've earned the right to talk about, then drop us a comment below or email us at hey at nagshow.co.za and you could be invited on. You can also send us a voice note or video comment to our WhatsApp number and you could be featured in an upcoming show. Until the next episode, don't forget to check out all our channels across YouTube, Facebook, and Game Explorers, a channel on the Ayoba app. We have a family of over 200,000 viewers and readers, so come in and join the fun. Nag out.